Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Missy Potts. I'm one of the interventional radiologists. I'm sure I've talked to many of you on the phone um, in the past. Um, but I just wanted to kind of give you guys an intro to IR. I was asked to talk about IR. There's a lot of topics to um, to cover, and so I'm just trying to give a broad general overview and maybe to make your lives a little easier when you call us, um, kind of the things that we need and the kind of things that we, we can offer and do in interventional radiology. Um, but basically, IR is a minimally invasive image-guided um, treatment and um, diagnosis um, types of procedures, and we do procedures across the body. Um, it was found, a uh, specialty found, founded back in 1960 by Charles Dodder, who um, was invented angioplasty and stenting for peripheral arterial disease, but it has grown into um, so much more since then. We use ultrasound, x-ray, CT. Um, you can do MRI-guided procedures. We don't really have the uh, equipment set up for that, but um, it can be done. We just don't utilize that at our institution. Um, but interventional radiology, the procedures we offer can decrease hospital stays, uh, minimize uh, complications, and save lives. And um, we really think of our um, specialty as more a part of the team. We try to collaborate with physicians. We work with almost every um, specialty in the hospital. Um, because as you can see from all the procedures that we offer, we pretty much cover everything. Now, uh, we don't do any of the um, intracranial stuff, but we do do some of the head and neck cases. Um, but you can see kind of the list here. I'm going to kind of touch on some of these procedures, the high points, and how it might be relevant to your day-to-day -day work. Um, but as this kind of shows, we just are, um, we do things everywhere. Um, I'm kind of going to go over a few things just to make your lives easier when you try and call us um, because I know that there's, ever since Cerner was implemented, there was never really a communication between us and the physicians on our expectations, and so it's kind of been a trial and error thing. And I know you guys probably get frustrated with trying to call IR and then we get frustrated, and so I'm just kind of going to give you guys a gist to make your lives easier and maybe make the process a lot better um, for you guys, for the patients, for everyone. Um, we re heavily rely on a phone call to us. We don't have a system in place that, like, tells us somebody wants an IR procedure. That is initiated with a phone call. Um, and so the kind of things that we're looking for, that it's nice if you have that information readily available. It may be our scheduler, Lori, or one of our technologists that at least takes the information to get for us. But we're looking for name, medical record, location, any pertinent patient history. And the most important thing is how the procedure we're performing is going to change management and kind of a timeline. So do you need it today? Do you need it tomorrow? What, what's the urgency? So we can kind of triage things. Um, we'll need labs. Platelets and INR are huge. Um, and then um, GFR, if we're needing to give contrast in patients with renal failure. Are the patients on blood thinners? If they're unstable, have they received transfusions? Um, and if they're unstable, what are their vital signs? Um, allergies, an important thing that sometimes we don't find out till the last minute are contrast allergies. And if we're going to be administering contrasts, we'd like to adequately pre-medicate patients. We will use the emergent... Um, um, medication if needed, but we try to try to minimize that. Um, NPO, obviously, in order to give sedation, we need patients to not have anything by mouth, no heavy meals for eight hours or a light meal for six hours. Um, but I will say um, paracentesis, thoracentesis, LPs, we don't give sedation for those procedures. So there's, you guys really don't have to give, uh, make those patients NPO for a paracentesis or a thoracentesis. Um, I know that some people in my department think that we should just have a blanket statement, but I hate to have patients be starving all day for a paracentesis or an LP when we're not giving sedation. Um, so, so those are some kind of things to, I guess, think about. For PICs, um, we don't give sedation for PICs, but if we have to convert it to a tunneled PIC, it is always nice to be able to give the patient a little medication to calm them. Um, and then if you order any things where we're draining fluid for you, um, make sure that the orders are in the computer. We don't like to put the orders in because if we put just cultures in and you guys want something else and we didn't order it, then it would be our fault. So. Um, but I, I'm not opposed if you talk on the phone and say, hey, I need this, I will try. But if, if it's like a whole list of things, it kind of makes it difficult. 
And then um, I skipped over consent. Um, also, once a patient's in IR, they're no longer a DNR, so that kind of puts a hold on the DNR. So we'll talk with patients a little bit about that because when we're off giving them sedation, obviously um, things can happen. They can get over-sedated. They can get arrhythmias, and we would those are things that we can reverse in IR, and so we would do that. Um, Cerner can be confusing for ordering things. I'm still trying to figure out what all our orders are, and I have to look on a sheet, so I know it's confusing. So don't hesitate to ask. Brian is our head tech, and he he can he knows a lot of them. Um, there's something in there called an XA interventional radiology consult that does like nothing. We don't get any like alerts or anything like that. So if you put one of those in, it I don't it just kind of hangs there. So it doesn't really do anything. Um, for XA pro X, X procedures, so that this is where it gets confusing too, because sometimes we'll tell you to put XA, or we'll tell you to put ultrasound, or we'll tell you to put CT in. Um, XA just means that we're performing the procedure in the IR suites. So arterial and venous cases, lines, paracentesis, thoracentesis, random liver biopsies, these are all things that we do in angio. Ultrasound guided procedures or ultrasound guided biopsies and some of their aspirations. And then in CT, we do biopsy drains and nerve blocks. So I know it's, it can be confusing, so just don't hesitate to ask us, but, um, but that's, that's kind of how that all works. Um, and then weekends and overnights for you guys when you call us. Um, basically, not to belabor a lot of this, but our on-call residents that you may talk to in the ER on the weekends, they don't know our schedule. They have no authority to approve cases. So um, if they promise you something will happen on Monday, I wouldn't trust that because a lot of times that message is not relayed to us, even when I'm on call the week for the weekend. So my recommendation would be to call first thing the next business day and just make sure that that message was relayed. Sometimes if we have rock star residents, they'll pass messages on. But otherwise, um, just assume that the message was lost in translation. Um, so, and then we always like prior imaging. So, um, and a lot of patients come with imaging from outside hospitals. So anytime you can get that stuff uploaded to Hellerad, that's a huge help for us for our planning our procedures, seeing if they need any more imaging and things like that. But enough about, like, all the technicalities and things. Um, but like I said, if any of that becomes confusing, just call us. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the things that we do day to day. Um, there is um, our SIR is our Society of Interventional Radiology. They give us all of our um, guidelines. So they're guidelines, so we don't stick hard to them, but they're kind of a place to start. So we have, there's different categories of procedures. Our category one procedures are our minimally invasive procedures. They're venous access, non-tunneled venous access, paras, thoras, thyroid FNAs, joint aspirations. So these are low risk of bleeding procedures. So the um, INR that's recommended for that is two or less. Now, um, sometimes, like, there's, there's different situations. I mean, we want it as close to two as possible, but for a para, I mean, we can go a little over two. If they're actively getting transfusion, then that's fine. We may not need a recheck. So we just have to work together to figure out, like, how realistically can these patients get these procedures done? Because, as you know, multiple transfusions result in out, um, increased health care costs. And so we want to try and work with you guys to, to, um, to make, minimize that for the patient. Um, platelets less than 50 for those procedures, and then really that's the things that we look at. Um, for level two and level three cases, which are pretty much everything else, more invasive cases, um, we want the ironer to be less than 1.5 or as close to that as possible, and platelets less than 50, or, or greater than 50, I apologize. So, um, but anyway, so that's kind of where our guidelines come from, but they're, like I said, their guidelines are not hard, fast rules. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about vascular access just for people that may not, because sometimes we get consults and people don't know the difference between a, a tunneled pick and a shyly and a perm cast. So I'm just going to show you pictures, kind of talk about these briefly. Um, but when you're calling for a vascular access request, the indication, the length of time needed, does the patient have any coagulopathies or ongoing infections? We don't like to place tunneled lines, um, specifically the perm cast and ports in patients with active infections. We've actually had a run of um, port infections, which we has pretty much been localized to the BMT, the leukemics, 
Um, but we're, we're trying to reduce any sort of infection across the board. Um, and then patients that are like chronically needing vascular access, these can sometimes be a nightmare because they may have central occlusions and that sort of thing. So um, if you know that a patient might be a vascular access nightmare from an outside hospital that we don't have records of, that's always helpful. Um, here's a uh, pick, um, my favorite. Um, so they, um, the pick is um, start inserted peripherally in the arm. We have a pick team here that does a lot of these. We prefer that they attempt this first, um, only because bringing the patient to us increased healthcare costs, causes um, increased radiation to the patient, um, is a huge util utilization of our resources. So we do ask that the pick team at least try. Um, but just because a PIC team doesn't get it doesn't mean that we can't get it. A lot of times they say the veins are too small, that sort of thing, and we have no problem with it. So, um, but um, that's kind of what that looks like. When you, if you are looking at a chest X-ray, if the PIC team places or replace it or whatever, and you're wanting to look at the location, um, the tip of the catheter, which is there a pointer up here or something or. I don't think, oh, here, I got, this is working now. So you can see the tip's right here, so it's about at the cavoatrial junction. That's a good spot. Sometimes if the cath, this is like along where the SVC is, if they're a little short, sometimes they can um, cause problems and not work as well. So we always aim to put them in the upper right atrium or the cavoatrial junction, so this is a good location. Um, here's a couple of cases of bad um, pick placements. So this, if it takes this sharp angle like this here, this suggests that the catheter went into the azagous vein. And so it's not that it's going to cause a patient any problem. I just probably wouldn't use it. You may not be able to aspirate blood back from it. It just probably would um, best serve the patient to have this repositioned, which we can do un um, under fluoro and IR. Um, here, it's probably difficult to see, but the um, catheter is going up the internal jugular vein, so we'll get calls to um, fix that. If you notice this in the evening um, and need us to fix it the following day, I would recommend getting a, um, a chest x-ray in the morning. Sometimes when it goes up this way, um, it'll flip down on its own. So sometimes when we bring patients down to fix it, it's already fixed itself. Um, tunnel picks. So these are reserved for patients that have renal failure. We want to preserve their um, access in their arms in case they need a fistula or something for dialysis in the future. So we'll put tunneled picks in them. It's um, access into the internal jugular vein with a small um, tunnel of the catheter underneath the skin. Um, they have this little cuff here um, that um, helps kind of prevent infection and tunnel lines. Um, obviously can stay in longer, patients can go home with this, um, and so they, ha and they have a lower rate of infection. Um, there have been some placement issues that I've come across that some um, facilities will not accept patients with tunneled picks, so we've had to place picks in them. So if you're planning to send patients to a facility, um, you may want to check with them and see if they accept patients with tunneled picks. Um, hemodialysis, so there's tunneled and non-tunneled. Um, the the um, non-tunneled, um, typically you guys can place on the floor, um, but we will place them too. Um, and then the um, tunneled ones are tunneled underneath the skin, similar to the um, tunneled picks, except these are larger caliber catheters. Um, this is a picture just showing the wire going down and then the catheter going in. I like the tip of these catheters to be kind of lower, more in the right atrium, because when you're doing hemodialysis, you've got um, high rates of flow um, during the procedure. And if the catheter is short and kind of in the SVC, you may um, run into problems during dialysis and may not be able to achieve those flow rates that you need for the, the um, treatment. And then ports, uh, we place a lot of ports. Um, there's uh, the single lumen, the dual lumens are usually reserved for the leukemics and lymphoma patients. Um, and so um, this is, I mean, you guys have probably seen lots of ports. And I, it's similar, upper right atrium, cavoatrial junction. Um, we see a lot of ports that um, are placed elsewhere or <coughs> surgically, the subclavian ports that end up short. And if they're short like this, they're more likely to get a fibrin sheath. Um, and then not work down the line. So we've just found that they, they last longer, they work more effectively if the tip's a little lower. Um, to talk about IR emergencies, there's a lot of, uh, lot of different things that we do on an emergent, urgent basis. So I'm going to kind of hit the high points of each um, and, uh, 
and kind of go from there. Um, arterial injuries, so we do a lot of trauma here, obviously. But as far as um, internal medicine being involved in some of these, I mean, it's not uncommon that that internal medicine would call us with a patient with a bleed, um, whether it's iatrogenic. Um, some of the pseudoaneurysms are related to just degenerative uh, disease, infection, inflammation, pancreatitis, vasculitis. So these are all things that can result in arterial, embol- um, arterial injuries. And um, how we manage these just kind of depends upon the flow distal to the artery, whether we do perform an embolization or stent, so basically the location. So I picked a few cases um, that um, internal medicine was involved. These are not trauma patients, so um, just to kind of go over. So this is a young female. Um, She has cirrhosis. Um, She's had multiple episodes of pancreatitis, um, and she had a recent episode of pancreatitis. So you can see here she's got some ascites. Her liver's enlarged. Um, and she's got where this arrow is, this abnormal area of contrast accumulation. She's got significant ascites. Um, but so she, ha- she ended up having a, a pseudoaneurysm off the splenic artery. Now, ideally, we want to preserve flow to the spleen, but this is a large spleen with very tortuous arteries. So really, the only way to adequately treat this was to coil across the um, pseudoaneurysm, which is what we did um, here. And so the pseudoaneurysm is gone. Unfortunately, probably lost some perfusion to the spleen, but um, when I checked her records, I mean, there wasn't, um, she was discharged um, shortly after this procedure, so um, she, so far she had done fine. Um, this is, there's a hepatic artery pseudoaneurysm here, so this was done, um, this was occurred after a random liver biopsy. So um, while this is very, very, very uncommon for random liver biopsies, it can happen. So if you have an inpatient that needs a a random liver biopsy, um, I always tell the patients the pain should get better, not worse. So if the patient is describing their pain as getting worse over time, then that may warrant further evaluation. Uh, Maybe just check a hemoglobin and um, maybe start with ultrasound if you're concerned that they're they're having any bleeding issues. But this is easily treated with um, just embolization of the pseudoaneurysm. Um, here's another case. This patient, this is a surgical patient, but this patient had had a Whipple. But I um, brought this case just because patients with infected fluid collections, which is um, what this patient had, they had um, some, inf- uh, some fluid here. It may have had some pancreatic enzymes, but they developed a, a, um, a pseudoaneurysm off the superior mesenteric artery. So this was a case that um, we, in order, because we don't want to coil the superior mesenteric artery, obviously, and cut off uh, blood flow to the bowel, we um, placed a covered stent across it um, and were able to preserve flow and exclude the pseudoaneurysm and um, stop the bleeding. Um, Acute GI bleeds, uh, I'm sure you guys encounter this uh, quite frequently. Upper GI bleeds causes gastritis, ulcers, Mallory Weiss tear, iatrogenic or pancreatitis. With the lower GI bleeds, uh, diverticulosis, cancer, cancer angiodysplasia, and polypectomy. Um, and then there's, there's a difference between the arterial bleed and then the venous GI bleeds, um, which are treated totally, different, uh, totally differently, and they're t- typically treated with a TIPS procedure. So it's important first to distinguish when the patient's having a GI bleed, um, if it's an arterial bleed or if it's a venous bleed. Um, as far as the acute uh, GI bleeds, the arterial ones, uh, or well, in uh, the venous ones, usually endoscopy is the first line. Um, s- instances where you may want to call us before GI would be if the bleeding is severe and ongoing. Um, and predictors that endoscopy will fail and that our services may be needed are patients with shock, Hemoglobin's less than 10, although that's, that's, I don't know how true that is. Um, But patients requiring multiple transfusions, if they have significant comorbidities, and if they don't have an adequate bowel prep. Um, For evaluation of lower GI bleeds, it's always good for these patients to have a Foley catheter. If they start to develop contrast in the bladder, that can sometimes obscure our visualization of these bleeds. Um, and then we always tell the patients, because as many of you who have dealt with these patients are aware, that these bleeds can come and go, and they can stop and go. And so we always tell the patient that we may not see anything, and we may have to bring you back down here, but we're going to do everything we can to find it, but there is a chance that this may require repeat interventions. 
Um, for upper GI bleeds, for bleeds in the gastric fundus, we would coil the left gastric artery, if, um, sometimes even if we don't see anything. And um, based on endoscopy, we're pretty confident that's the location. Um, we will perform GDA, gastroduodenal artery embolization, for uh, bleeds in the gastric antrum or in the proximal um, duodenum. And then um, uh, the GDA pseudoaneurysms, we can also, we've also um, embolized those, which I have a case here. This is an old case. I don't know where. I think I picked this case up at fellowship um, from a colleague or something. But um, here, because we don't typically just do aortograms looking for these bleeds, we're a little more selective than this. But um, you can see this abnormal area here, which um, place a catheter into the gastroduodenal artery. You see the pseudoaneurysm here. Because there's sufficient collateral flow, we can easily coil the gastroduodenal artery. We do that quite frequently. Coil is placed across the pseudoaneurysm, and you no longer see it. Um, for lower GI bleeds, um, sometimes we will ask you to get a tagged red blood cell study. Sometimes the CTA can actually show these bleeds. Um, but the reason we do this is because the TAG study is way more sensitive than our angiography. So if a TAG red blood cell study is performed and it does not see a GI bleed, then there's no way we're going to see it in angiography. Um, a CTA um, is a little more sensitive than angiography for picking up a bleed, but we need a bleed rate of about a half a milliliter to a milliliter a minute for us to be able to um, pick it up and see it. The other thing I would encourage is as soon, if you guys order that tagged red cell scan, as soon as you guys first are aware that this study is positive, call IR. Because what has happened um, a couple times is a, a tagged red blood cell study is done, and then we don't get a call until hours or maybe even the next day. Well, that bleeding could have stopped. And so then we come in and it's negative. Well, there was a bleed there and now it's not there. So as soon as you guys find out that that study is positive, give us a call and we'll take care of it. Um, we try and go as close to the um, area of bleeding as possible when we coil um, to reduce any sort of um, ischemic injury to the bowel. If there's a diffuse bleeding, we use large particles, but that's not very common that we would need to do that. So here's a case. Um, this is an injection of the inferior mesenteric artery and um, through um, the, the imaging sequence, and you can see this abnormal area here. Um, and so um, more selective catheterization. Well, this is a zoomed-in thing of it, but... Um, so more selective catheterization of this. We were able to drop some coils in very um, closely to where the bleeding was, very selectively, and um, embolize the bleed. Uh, variceal bleeding um, is related to portal hypertension. So that occurs when patients have liver disease, whether cirrhosis, hepatitis, um, and it causes resistance to flow that can result in the development of portosystemic collaterals or varices. Um, and so if you're unable to manage this medically or endoscopically, then a TIPS um, would be the next line of therapy. We do ask that patients prior to us performing a TIPS have a CT with contrast. This, um, one of the big things is that we're looking at the portal veins, the patency of the portal veins. Um, will we be able to um, place the shunt from a hepatic vein to a portal vein? Because if they're occluded or things like that, it just changes things. It's not always a hard, fast no, but it, would change, it may change our approach. Um, if the patient has gastric varices alone, then this may be related to splenic vein thrombosis. So we would need to know that because the best um, treatment for that would be a splenectomy and not a TIPS procedure. So um, other indications for TIPS aside from the bleeding would be ascites, uh, refractory ascites, which we will see those, and we typically will do those on an outpatient basis. But we can also do TIPS for Bud Chiari, a hepatic hydrothorax, um, portal hypertensive gastropathy. Um, some of the contraindications to TIPS would be heart failure. Um, if you can imagine, by creating a shunt from the portal vein into the hepatic vein, we're increasing that blood flow to the heart, which is going to add even more strain to the heart um, and so, um, so that could worsen uh, a patient's heart failure. 
Um, if the patient has uncontrolled encephalopathy, we would only worsen that. Um, so sometimes when patients develop encephalopathy um, following a TIPS, we actually have to go in and put a new TIPS in, a stenose TIPS, to reduce the flow. Um, so if a patient has encephalopathy, we would only make that worse. And then patient with severe liver failure. Um, the relative contraindications would be biliary obstruction, malignancy. Typically, we don't do these with pa in patients with malignancy, but if it's small burden disease, then that wouldn't be um, a total no. Um, like I said, portal vein thrombosis, we would just have to review the images closely and see if they're still a candidate. And then polycystic liver disease. Um, typically, patients with a MELD greater than 24, um, it, they just don't do well with this procedure, so that's kind of the area that we use. So it's always good to have an idea of the patient's MELD, which is based on their INR, the bilirubin, and the creatinine, um, kind of where they lie. And their, it's, the MELD is actually a really good predictor of the patient's post-TIPS mortality. So when we're weighing risk-benefit, um, this is a, a good uh, tool. So this is a TIPS procedure. We get access in the internal jugular vein, place our catheter, our sheath, um, down into the hepatic veins, typically the right hepatic vein. Um, and then we basically poke the liver until we get blood returned from the portal vein. And then we can place our um, sheath across um, the liver parenchyma, connecting the two veins. And we dilate up our track and place this uh, stent. So the, um, the distal portion is uncovered, but this uh, portion that goes through the liver is covered. Um, and so um, patients typically do really well. So you can see this patient had uh, varices here, and following placement of the tips, these do not opacify. If we put a tips in and these still were opacifying, then we can go in and coil embolize them, and reduce bleeding. Um, a homoptysis, sometimes we get consults um, regarding homoptysis. We really, um, for these, um, these can be tricky, um, and they're best seen when the patient's homoptysis is massive. Now, different people want to define homoptysis, massive homoptysis different ways. Um, one source uh, says it's about 300 milliliters in 24 hours, um, but really it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis because there's no definite definition of what massive homoptysis is. Um, the causes can be TP, TB. Um, in our patient popula population, malignancy is a very common cause, um, but cystic fibrosis and sarcoidosis. Um, we don't, when we do an angiography, we don't see extravasation like we do with a lot of our other bleeds. It's very subtle. So there's some hypertrophy, some neovascularity, maybe some shunting, aneurysm formation. So we really rely heavily on what is found on, um, in bronchoscopy. And so if they say that the bleed's coming from the right upper lobe then, and it kind of looks abnormal, then we would just embolize that. So it's, it's again, like that collaborative effort to kind of figure this out because it's not going to jump out at us or um, typically. We use large particles for this. Um, be, um, we don't typically use gel foam. It's one of our temporary embolizing agents because uh, they recur. Coils we typically don't want to use because if we need to go in and re-intervene, it would block our um, access for future intervention. And this is another one of those procedures that, like the GI bleeds, this can recur. So we just let patients um, know that they can have recurrent bleeds and need repeat interventions. I think we had a patient uh, a week or two ago that they had had a prior um, embolization years ago. So, that, I mean, they may even come back years later. Um, and for us, it's important to know our anatomy. Um, one thing we do talk with the patients about is the risk of paralysis following this procedure. Um, the spinal artery, there's a spinal artery that we need to pay close attention to because we do not want to embolize that and risk paralysis or um, embolization of the spine. So that's one thing we discuss with patients because we have actually had one patient in the past, my colleague went to consent him, and he said, no, no, thank you, because he didn't want to risk that. Now, it's not a, I mean, it should be a mild risk, but some patients just don't want to deal with it. So, um, so here, uh, this bronchial artery is way larger than a lot of the ones we see. Sometimes they are very difficult to um, canalize. So this one's very enlarged, um, very uh, just tortuous vessels here. It's all just very abnormal. So this is um, increased vascularity. So this um, is um, a patient with hemoptysis. 
Um, percutaneous biliary drainage. Um, so we'll do these um, when ERCP fails to be able to put a biliary stent up. Um, most commonly in the acute setting, we'll do this for acute cystitis or co acute cholangitis. Um, but we'll do it for biliary obstruction, bile leaks um, as well. Um, contraindications, large volume ascites. Um, I think my colleagues on Monday, I wasn't here, but they put in a biliary drain in a patient with ascites, but we also put in a drain to drain the ascites. Because if you can imagine, if you put in a biliary drain and then bile leaks, back into the ascites and the peritoneum, then you can cause a significant peritonitis. So it just um, it, it creates an increased risk for the patient. And then we just, um, again, going back to the INR be, needing to be 1.5 just to reduce bleeding risk. Um, personally, I, uh, I guess depending upon how you approach this, if patients have dilated bile ducts, I really um, like to do a left-sided approach. Um, and I joke because the women in, uh, in my department, me and Dr. Dinglossen, that's our approach. We like to do um, ultrasound. So if you ever see a biliary drain coming from here, it's just because we're going in the left lobe um, using ultrasound guidance. Sometimes they come out the right side, and usually that's the guys. They stick, um, they stick pretty much blindly um, from the right side with the needle under floral guidance. And so it's just different techniques. All depends upon how you're trained, but um, they do the same thing as long as the biliary systems that are obstructed connect. So, just something that you may see um, in your patients. Um, if the patient's very dilated, then we can do moderate sedation. But if they're not, or the patient, these can be very painful procedures. So, more often than not, we will try and do these with general anesthesia, especially if we're trying to bypass an obstruction. These patients will jump off the table. And so it's just a much smoother procedure if we have um, anesthesia's help for these. Um, and so I talked about kind of about the approach. Um, I get a lot of questions like after we place these for you guys, what do I do with the tube now? What do I tell my patients? Like, what now? So um, my personal approach is if... We, I like for them to be internalized. I like to minimize the bag drainage for patients as much as possible, make their lives as easy as possible. So typically after a fresh one, it's a good idea to keep it to a bag for 24 hours. And then after that 24 hours, just put a cap on it because technically, um, let me see, technically this is a, this is a case, but um, the, the drain should be draining as it would physiologically into the bowel. So if this tube's capped, then all the bile that was, um, that was um, obstructed should be going through the catheter and into the bowel. So um, you can give it a trial, but if, the, if it starts leaking around the skin site, um, the entrance site to um, the tube, then that could suggest that the tube's obstructed. So if it starts leaking, just put it back to a bag and maybe call us um, for a tube injection or an evaluation. But usually that's kind of my suggestion is keep it to a bag at the first 24 hours after the placement, allow the system to decompress, and then give them a trial of capping it. And you can always kind of trend the bilirubin um, in these patients and see if it's actually working. Um, we recommend that these patients get these exchanged every two to three months. Some require it more frequently because theirs gets clogged. Um, so we just kind of figure out what's best for the patient. Sometimes they need upsizing. Um, I try not to, I try to put at least a 10 or 12 in, but um, today I just upsize somebody to a 14. So we just got to play with it until we get them to an optimal level where they have a good quality of life and appropriate drainage. Um, complications from this, sepsis. These patients can get septic fast and bleeding. Um, and then when we do them, they may go up to the floor and develop rigors. So um, what we recommend is 25 to 50 milligrams of Demerol. After the procedure, I've seen it. I don't see it as much here. I haven't, but in fellowship, I saw it a couple times. And these patients, you just wrap them with a ton of blankets, and they're, like, shaking because they're, like, so cold and, and you give them the, the start with 25 of Demerol and um, they, they seem to do a lot better. But these patients, because the, it's inevitable that some of the, um, the infection that's been built up, it can go into the, um, the bloodstream. So this, I mean, this, as I was shown before, is a case, this is from that, um, 
approach um, by sticking the mid axillary line with the need, um, needle. You would pacify the biliary tree, pass a wire down. This was an obstructed stent. We don't jump to stents for people because they can occlude. So we typically preserve stent stenting for patients with six months or less um, to live. Um, so we kind of hold off on those because these just don't stay open forever. Um, percutaneous cholecystostomy. It's reserved for poor surgical candidates. So I was called in last evening for one of these. Um, and basically these are patients that can't have their gall, that have acute cholecystitis, can't have their gallbladder removed for whatever reason and um, need some sort of drainage. So um, if the case is inconclusive, then we would recommend a HIDA scan. But as last night, like there was a case and the imaging was pretty convincing. It's acute cholecystitis. This guy um, had heart failure, renal failure. It was not a good idea to leave him overnight with an infected um, gallbladder. So came in, put the tube in, and, and done with it. Um, the one thing, though, that um, is important to note is that these tubes need to be in for about four weeks. The tr tract needs to um, mature. Um, if we were to, for that patient that I did last night, if we remove the tube today, then they would just leak the contents of the gallbladder into, into the peritoneum and can have a, a significant peritonitis. So allow the tract to mature. We go through um, the liver. Um, so here's a patient, the CT, an inflamed, enlarged, dilated gallbladder. A patient had right upper quadrant pain, elevated white count, fever. Um, and this is one approach. Some of my colleagues place it in CT, but me being the fan of ultrasound that I am, um, we go, th this is the liver here, place a needle through the liver into the gallbladder, um, and then you can inject contrast under fluoro, see that the needle tips in the gallbladder, pass a wire, and then pass the tube over the wire. Um, nephrostomies, I think I'm getting close to um, being finished here. Um, a lot of times, I guess, I mean, you guys will see these patients too. A lot of times we get calls from urology. Um, but pyonephritis would be the emergent indication, so pus on an obstructed system. These patients present with fever, flank pain, and hydronephrosis. Um, and so those need to be done in a timely fashion to relieve that and reduce sepsis. Um, acute renal failure, it's not an emergent um, indication, but it, it is urgent if the patient is in acute renal failure, um, particularly if they have a a solitary kidney or something like that. We um, need to do this um, in a timely fashion. But hyperkalemia um, wouldn't be an indication to rush in. Those should be corrected medically or by emergent dialysis before the percutaneous nephrostomy is um, considered because it would be hard for us to kind of sedate these patients appropriately if they have um, something like that going on. Um, but we'll do these on an outpatient basis or preoperatively for the urologist. So, again, ultrasound and guidance, um, access into a posterior calyx. This is a, a dilated um, collecting system similar to the cholecystostomy tube placement. We can pass a wire through that um, and then over the wire place the tube. Um, PE, I'll touch on this briefly. I think this is the last topic I'm going to cover. Um, because there's some kind of cool new things we're doing with this, um, but we're treating um, mainly submassive PEs, and um, so PE, acute PE causing right heart strain. Um, and so we're looking on CT imaging, all these patients that have the CTPE protocol, we have imaging to show us that they have um, a, a right heart strain by looking at the RV to LV diameter, um, or sometimes these patients will have an echo. But this really, um, Management of this is a multidisciplinary approach. But here's a CT in a patient um, that has right heart strain. So the RV ratio to the LV ratio is obviously greater than 0.9. And this is um, following um, the ECOS procedure, um, showing that reduction in that right heart strain. Um, so, and I'll kind of go over that in just a second. But, um, Thrombolysis, you guys are probably aware of contraindications to patients receiving lytics, so I won't spend too much time there. Um, but we have multiple ways that we can help um, in management of PEs and patients that are not uh, appropriate candidates for systemic TPA. Um, so we do ECOS, um, and that's an intravascular ultrasound that separates fibrin, um, allowing, and then we inject the TPA through the catheters. 
Um, and then also for patients that cannot receive um, thrombolytics, we use, we've been using the penumbra um, thrombectomy system with some um, good results. So this, um, our rep came in, I think last week, and kind of showed me this study, which is actually um, very promising. It's very new data. It hasn't been like written up um, because it's so new. It's been presented as an abstract. But they've actually um, have patients that they've used this ecosystem on, and they've administered, there's different cohorts, but they, they're kind of seeing how long you actually have to have the catheter in administering the TPA. So cohort one was for two hours. Cohort two is four hours, and then cohorts three and four were six hours, and then they kind of played with the dosing of the TPA. And what's interesting is that whether they had the two hours, the four hours, or the six hours, the reduction in the right heart strain um, was the same for all of these. So my question is, moving forward, why would I not just give TPA at a fairly low dose for two hours and be done with it. So it's kind of cool because um, these patients need to be spent time in the ICU, so that reduces time in the ICU, and it's we, we just pull the catheters out at the end. We don't have to get any follow-up imaging. They just go up to the ICU with these catheters in place. So it's actually pretty cool. The only problem, the only caveat is this lacks long-term data. It's only about a year out. But um, these patients were monitored 48 hours after, and after two hours of the ECOS therapy, they did the same as patients have done um, with 12 and 24 hours. So... Um, Here's a PE on the, um, the right pulmonary artery. Here's these ECOS catheters that we put in place. The patient goes up to the floor with these. They give the TPA, do their thing for a few hours, and then we pull them. And then you would want to check an echo or a CT or something to evaluate for right heart strain following the procedure. So we follow the patient symptomatically. We wouldn't bring them down to do another um, arteriogram. You could just get an echo. Um, the penumbra system stole this from um, one of my friends on Twitter. But um, so this system, you just basically stick this, lo this catheter in and just suck out the clot. And so, and you can see here all the clot that was aspirated back, no lytics, so safer for patients. Um, people ask, how do you choose? Um, if patients have a lot of like segmental and smaller clots, the ecosystem may be better. Um, but definitely patients that aren't candidates for lytics with acute PE, we could um, go in there and suck out the clots and have pretty good uh, success with that. Um, and then patients may need a filter, so just remember that. Um, IVC filter placement, I forgot that I had a little bit of information about that. Um, the patients basically that are unable to have anticoagulation that have... Um, that have DVT or PE. This is a little chart, the differences of what societies recommend P uh, filters based on different things. Um, but interventional radiology and the American College of Radiology are the only ones that recommend filters for a mobile thrombus, so a free-floating thrombus in the IVC. No one else has commented on it, but it seems to make sense to me um, if you have this clot in the IVC here. This is at the level of the renal veins. It's just free floating there. It just seems like disaster waiting to happen. Uh, so we can place a super renal filter um, just so that this patient would not have a large mass of PE. So you can see the filter in a super renal location here. So um, I know it's a lot to cover. Um, we do a lot of procedures. We work with a lot of services. Um, but uh, hopefully this will give you a little bit of information about what we do, some different things to think about when you call us and need to discuss a case. Um, and then we just um, we, we rely on a collaborative approach. So um, we're, we're happy to work with you guys with whatever your needs are. And if you guys ever have any questions, I'm here primarily, I'm at the VA one or two days a week. For the people at the VA or for anybody that rotates at the VA, if you have any questions or if you need something to hire, just talk to EJ and get on his good side because that's the best way to order a test at the VA. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks for letting me come and talk.